Good evening, everyone. My name is Anastasia Warren. Thank you for joining us tonight for Erasure by Exclusion, How Art Schools and Institutions Uphold White Supremacy. Um, ushers are around distributing index cards. I think most of you have gotten some that um, will be collected about 45 minutes into the event um, to distribute to the panel. Um, I would like to thank the Visual Critical Studies Department here at SVA for sponsoring the event. I would also like to thank my parents for instilling in me the kind of freedom that brings us here tonight to challenge the institution that houses us. A huge thank you to Shailene Rodriguez for being a collaborator and teacher as we've worked together to organize this discussion. I'm in my third year at SVA, and during my time here, I've had one black professor and could count on fi my fingers and toes the number of artists of color who have been introduced to me in a classroom setting. This absence is where the necessity for this panel was found. After communicating, with the, after communicating to VCS chairman Tom Hewn, the personal toll and overall impact of the lack of representation of the contributions of people of color to the art world, he suggested organizing a panel and introduced me to Shailene. And here we are. Together we will examine cultural erasure and discuss the nature of this oversight with the intention of identifying solutions to this problem. Our panelists are Robin J. Hayes, PhD. <laughs> Hayes wrote, directed, and produced the award-winning documentary, Black in Cuba. She's developing the television series, Fortune, an adaptation of the prize-winning novel, In the Land of Love and Drowning. Tamashi Jackson, born in Houston, Texas. <laughs> Raised in California, raised in Los Angeles, California, excuse me. She is represented by Jack Tilton Gallery in New York City and teaches drawing and interrelated media practice at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Cheryl R. Riley. <laughs> Cheryl is a National Endowment for the Arts recipient whose visual art and furniture designs are in the collections of the Smithsonian, the Mint Museum of Architecture and Design, the cities of New York and Atlanta, among others. She's also written about arts and artists for national publications and is, in, and is a private and corporate art advisor with a focus on artists of the African diaspora. Bill Gaskins. <laughs> Bill is an, assist, is an associate professor in the Department of Art and American Studies program at Cornell University. As an artist, he explores the intersection of, intersections of photography, cinema, and portraiture in the 21st century from an interdisciplinary engagement that include his body of essays on art and culture through the frames of history of photography, art history, American and African-American studies scholarship. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Shalene Rodriguez. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for what I think is going to be a powerful conversation, getting to the heart of the matter at hand, identifying and undoing the structures that continue to exclude the intellectual and avant-garde accomplishments and contributions of the black and indigenous diaspora to the world from academic discourse and learning. I'd like to take this moment to thank you, Tom Hewn, and the Visual and Critical Studies uh, Department for hosting this discussion. My <clears throat> my co-moderator here, the brilliant Anastasia Warren. A very special thank you goes to the many scholars who've assisted me with suggestions and research for this panel, Dr. Ruthie Wilson-Gilmore, Robin D.G. Kelly, and Maria Alexandra Garcia, who introduced me to the many important books that will frame this discussion. So let us imagine a syllabus together. That's us imagining. <clears throat> and this syllabus will contain snapshots of uh, important moments in history, in art history. How can we place Bruce Nauman and John Baldessari on this syllabus and not invoke the names of David Hammonds, 
or Adrian Piper? How do we discuss David Wanarovich and not Martin Wong? How could we discuss ABC No Rio and not the New Yorican Poets Cafe? Allen Ginsberg and not Pedro Pietri, Sonia Sanchez, or Amiri Baraka? How can we fail to connect Europe's neo-imperialism manifested in the Berlin Conference when the major European powers convened to normalize claims to territories in Africa, essentially dividing up the continent and ushering in a period of heightened colonial violence which eliminated or overrode most existing forms of African autonomy and self-governance? How can we discount this history from the subsequent influences Africa then had on modern art? How are we teaching surrealism in the context of World War I and World War II and failing to make connections to the anti-colonialist response to which the surrealists were so tied? How is it that the fascist Marinetti and his futurist manifesto is anchored on every art syllabus, but the surrealist essay, Murderous Humanitarianism, where Andre Breton, Pierre Yoyote, Yves Tanguy, and many others in response to the Rift War declare, quote, we surrealists pronounced ourselves in favor of changing the imperialist war in its chronic and colonial form into the civil war. Thus we place our energies in the service of the revolution of the proletariat and its struggles and define our attitudes towards the colonial problem and hence towards the color question. How does this remain an obscure footnote? How can we discuss surrealism as influenced by Marx and Freud, but not one of the most important decolonial thinkers, the Martinetian poet and author M. Cesaire, who, dis who besides helping to create the Negritude movement in France and founding the surrealist publication Tropiques, also mentored the great Franz Fanon. That Cesaire shared a close friendship with André Breton is the least of his qualifiers. That the surrealists saw, found themselves trying to construct the thing they saw as occurring naturally in jazz and the blues, as we are all well aware of the consistent presence of the black American avant-garde in France. Josephine Baker, Claude McKay, Nina Simone, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, and many others. This opens up further the gaps on our imagined syllabus. Renowned writer Toni Morrison addresses this consistent presence in her book of literary criticism titled Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination. She says, quote, for some time now I have been thinking about the validity or vulnerability of a certain set of assumptions conventionally accepted among literary historians and critics and circulated as knowledge. This knowledge holds that traditional, canonical American literature is free of, uninformed, and unshaped by the 400-year-old presence of first Africans and then African Americans in the United States. It assumes that this presence, which shaped the body politic, the Constitution, and the entire history of the culture has had no significant place or consequence in the origin and development of that culture's literature. Moreover, such knowledge assumes that the characteristics of our national, our national literature emanate from a particular Americanness that is separate from and unaccountable to this presence. This Americanness Morrison points to which at its extreme, one might imagine, appears as the Rockwellian delusions of the current president, functions as a firmament. It reaffirms itself. Although our conversation this evening will be framed within the art context, the art institutions where we today do our learning share in this inheritance of Western imperialism woven into the philosophical legacy of the Enlightenment. This reaffirmation of self that Morrison points to and the knowledge it asserts which wedges itself into the canon has a structure. Foucault describes this in his work, The Archaeology of Knowledge, as quote, that ideological use of history 
of which one tries to restore to man everything that has unceasingly eluded him for, for, for over a hundred years, end quote. Foucault offers that when the gatekeepers of knowledge, culture, or in the case of Toni Morrison, American literature, which she writes has been, quote, the preserve of white male views, genius, and power, when these gatekeepers decenter the subject in relation to the laws of his desire, the forms of his language, the rules of his action or discourse, when one questions outside of the systems created for understanding that are taken for granted, that are considered the default and are shaped by the legacy of that enlightenment, enlightenment which also means imperialism, it means white supremacy and anti-blackness, it means capitalism, Protestant ethic, and patriarchy. Foucault says, quote, when it becomes clear that man himself questioned as to what he was could not account for his sexuality and his unconscious, the systematic forms of his language, or the regularities of his fiction. The theme of a continuity of history has been reactivated once again, a history that would not, a history that would be not division, but development, not an interplay of relations, but an internal dynamic, not a system, but a hard work of freedom, not form, but the unceasing effort of a consciousness turned upon itself, trying to grasp itself in its deepest conditions. A history that would be both an act of long, uninterrupted patience and the vivacity of a movement which in the end breaks all bounds. The description for this panel begins with the statement, the art world is a microcosm of the society we live in. On the macro, the gaps in our imagined syllabus mirror the gaps in the way history is taught in the United States. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 may have forced the integration of the people in the United States somewhat, but it said nothing about integrating our history, about telling the story of the relationships, the interconnections, the cause and effects that weave the people of the United States together for better or worse. Instead, black accomplishments, trials, tribulations, and contributions are regulated to the month of February and presented as oversimplified tropes about bus boycotts and overcoming. With no context or connection, this segregated American history has been handed down to American students for generations. On the world stage, this gap lies in the documentation of the rise of the bourgeoisie and the formation of the proletariat without significant consideration of how these historical events are inextricably linked to Africa and the fact that modern capitalism is built on the bones of the Atlantic slave trade. A subject that the great Cedric Robinson meticulously investigates in his seminal text, Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition. <sighs> Okay, so these gaps have far reaching consequences for students of color who continue to be denied the experience of seeing themselves, a privilege taken for granted and therefore not addressed by those who hold positions of power in the institutions. Which leads to our first question for our panel this evening. Perhaps you can start by saying a little about yourselves and then sharing with us uh, how was your experience as a student affected by the lack of representation of people of color in your education, and uh, anyone can really start. Um, perhaps we can go Robin and go down the line. So I'm, um, I'm a professor at the New School in the Schools of Public Engagement, um, and I'm a professor of Management and Media Studies and International Affairs and Urban Policy because titles are free. Um, and, um, and as, as Anastasia, Anastasia mentioned, I'm also a, uh, a filmmaker and I, I have a production company called Progressive Pupil and our, um, our goal is to make black studies for everybody. And I have a PhD in African American studies and political science, not because I was particularly interested in political science, but because we had to have husband departments. I call them husband departments. Um, because uh, the fear was that as PhDs in African American studies, we would not be able to find work because very few African American studies departments have their own hiring lines. 
So usually you have to get hired by political science or history or English, and then you can be affiliated with African American studies or half with African American studies. So you really need that non-African American studies supervision and, and, uh, and uh, credential in order to immerse yourself in the study of race and inequality and the culture, politics, and history of the African diaspora, which is what black studies is. So, um, so that speaks to the question of how was my experience as a student affected by the lack of representation of people of color in education. I actually, as a graduate student, because I was in African American studies, I mean, I felt like I was in a different world, right? Like everybody, the television show. Mm -hmm. You just watch it on YouTube, it's really great if you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, because all, very many of my professors were black, very many of my fellow students were black, but something that we talk about in the film Black in Cuba is that it's not just about background, it's about concern, right? And so if your interest is in addressing white supremacy and the terror that um, it creates for communities of color, not just the United States and around the world, then it's not enough to um, just be there, you know, in that institution, enjoying the opportunities that an institution like SBA um, provides. You want to use what you have access to to make an impact. And so I think there was that kind of lack of representation, which was very painful and difficult for a number of us. Um, so we had, you know, people who looked like us, which was great, and they wanted to talk about France Fanon, they wanted to talk about Aimé Césaire, but they didn't necessarily want to talk about what we could do with that information right now, right? And so it's difficult to read about someone like Fanon who, uh, you know, had this process of awakening and coming to consciousness where those of you don't don't know um, his background you know he wrote this uh, classic work the wretched of the earth um, uh, but he started off you know being this young person from Martinique which is was a French colony it's a, a beautiful island in the Caribbean it's still basically a French colony it's a French department the way sort of the US Virgin Islands is an overseas is a territory um, so he you know, grew up middle class, and then he gets to go to university in Paris. He has to go to university in Paris because he, because um, uh, there are no universities in Martinique because there were no universities in colonies then. And so he, gets, he goes to Paris and he realizes everything he's learned his whole life about how he's a French person and he is part of this French civilization and liberté, égalité, la la la, um, doesn't apply to him because he's black, right? He's black. And in the end, he decides he really has to join the Algerian revolution because it's not enough to know. It's not enough for him to be the one black psychiatrist um, who sort of made it. it, it it's, it's everyone or no one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me, to the answer of that, you know, to wrap up, the question of representation is also a question of action and concern. And everyone doesn't have to have the same concerns. And everyone who has the same concerns doesn't look like you. Mm -hmm. But I think that, to me, has been the most enriching and empowering way to anchor myself, is a sense of purpose and, and what's the purpose of, of the education that I have access to and the work that I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Tomashi. All right. <laughs> if you insist. Um, so how was my uh, experience as a student affected by a lack of representation of people of color in my education? Um, I think of my art education as having begun uh, in the 1980s in Los Angeles. Um, I know now very well that I'm a beneficiary of uh, the work of Thurgood Marshall and the um, and the NAACP Legal and Educational Defense Fund um, because I'm a magnet school child from uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, and it didn't occur to me because we didn't talk about it. We didn't, talk, we didn't really talk about um, uh, in February or any other time the significance of the fact that we were being bused from black neighborhoods into the USC village to go to school and to be taught by working artists and that our school was actually um, 
uh, a big, a, a very intentional experiment um, uh, of school integration. So, you know, um, the first school desegregation, the first successful school desegregation case took place in Houston, Texas in 1949. Um, Heyman Marion Sweat versus Theophilus Painter desegregating um, uh, UT Austin Law School, um, leading to the creation of the Thurgood Marshall Law School and what is now known as uh, Texas Southern University, which used to be TSUN, Texas Southern Un uh, the University for the Negro. Um, so that was, and then there were so there were so many cases that took place before, even before that, um, there was there was a, a, a march to to uh, to uh, educational access, um, uh, and then after 1954, after the Brown versus Board of Education um, unanimous decision, which obviously would not happen now, um, it wouldn't happen now, it would not happen now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it took. 20 years, I live, you know, I, I, I uh, live part of my life in Massachusetts, and, you know, I, 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 um, I'm, rem I'm reminded all the time of the fact that this was a city that, you know, 20 some odd years, 22 years after the Supreme Court uh, desegregated um, uh, public schools, they had to be forced by federal intervention, and they went kicking and screaming, throwing rocks at black children, mm -hmm. rocking buses back and forth, trying to tip them over as they were filled with children. Um, uh, you know, spearing a man with a, I'm sure people have seen that, that photograph that was taken by a, a, a Neiman, a Harvard Neiman jur journalism fellow, uh, spearing a black man who was just walking through. <laughs> he was a lawyer, actually, he was, a, he was from Yale Law, actually. Yeah, um, you know, insanity, complete insanity. Um, uh, and I've gotten to know this, um, I have a, I'm, I have a, I'm, I'm veering a little bit, but I have a best friend who's an education policy specialist. And um, I didn't know, like, I didn't know really, I didn't really know until this last go around in graduate school um, uh, at Yale, at the Yale School of Art, how implicated I am in all of this, because that's how, that's how I've been taught. Um, and I'm, and I, and I still consider myself a beneficiary. I love, I love the places of education that, um, that have uh, 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 stewarded me and that I've had the opportunity to steward because I feel that responsibility in places that I occupy. But, um, you know, it took me until my 30s to realize like, oh, I'm Linda Brown. Oh, I'm the little black girl that people are like that hot not to educate. Um, and it took research. <laughs> and, and, and um, you know, so I'm thankful, I'm, I'm thankful that I have an artistic practice now and that I have, you know, friends across disciplines um, such that um, my, my work is a research, my, my practice is a research driven practice. And so, um, you know, I've looked to painting to try to um, unpack research around school desegregation because, or because, because we are living in a time of rapid and dramatic and very physical and bloody resegregation. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the perception of color impacts the value of human life in public space. Um, and, 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 even, and even more specifically, the treatment of children. Mm -hmm. You know, because how crazy is it, how crazy is it to, uh, you know, for a 200 pound man to, to mount a 15 year old girl and twist her arms behind her back and grind her face into the ground? Mm -hmm. How crazy is that? This is what we're seeing, right? And so I'm see I've been seeing all this stuff and I was thinking like, wow, this, this is crazy. And then, I, and then, you know, I'm watching policies uh, move all over the country to defund, to, to completely defund public schools, to defund what's left of um, bus programs, and um, and I'm hearing stories. I'm sitting in, you know, city hall in uh, Boston, uh, vo volunteering with NAACP Boston, and um, hearing people talk about being worried about their children having to take, you know, two and three buses and a train to get to school by eight o'clock in the morning, or they'll be tardy. Uh, and then they won't, or, or, or they'll be late, and then they won't end up getting into a good exam school, they won't go to college. And I was like, this sounds like the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So it's taken that long for me to realize that I'm a beneficiary, and that it took that long for the implementation, for, for what was allowed of the implementation of Brown to, to reach us. Mm -hmm. So I got, I got in at that sweet spot. So uh, 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 funding for public broadcasting, all magnet schools and um, centers for enriched studies, uh, busing programs, school, uh, school lunch programs, that all fed me. And because I was, a, I was, I just, I only ever thought of myself as an artist, as a child. I didn't think of myself, 
I didn't I didn't know that my blackness was a was was problematic until until I got uh, until I was around certain children um, as I moved up as I got older. Um, but still, like to make art was my primary purpose. I always thought that was my primary purpose in life. So uh, yeah, um, but I didn't see I didn't learn. I didn't uh, like you know blackness was often like a, a hyper negativized afterthought or like a guilty like a guilty afterthought like oh it's February let's talk about slavery and then everyone turns around and looks at me mm -hmm. um, you know um, and it wasn't until like I, I, I went home I'm from Los Angeles I went home uh, after I started so I started my education at the San Francisco Art Institute and I deferred from I, I dropped out and then eventually completed my education here in New York City at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. And then there I learned about um, uh, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT and ended up at MIT. I really wanted to be there. And then, um, uh, and then after a couple of years, I, I completed, I will not be doing more schooling, <laughs> but I, um, I, uh, I just completed a, an MFA at uh, the, the Yale School of Art for Painting. Um, and uh, but in between SFAI and, and, and Cooper Union, I went home to Los Angeles, and I and I was uh, hanging out in the old neighborhood, the USC Village, where I was an elementary school student, and I was in the library there and saw this huge, beautiful painting, uh, like a, a stained glass looking painting, in the library of Mary McLeod Bethune, and it was um it was Charles White, it was Charles White, one of the last things he ever did before he passed away, and. I didn't know about Charles White. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. And he was in Pasadena, like over the hill, where I used to hang out with my friends, like around, like over the hill from my high school, from my arts high school, where half the day was spent focused on this. Half the day was spent on art history that, that completely excluded like, like uh, most, most of the creative canon, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so you know, I, I guess I can end with that. That you know, like Charles White was in my city, wow. mm -hmm. and um, and I was growing up there, and didn't even know who he was um, until he had passed away, and um, and that is a it's a it's it's a crime. So thanks. <laughs> um, so we have that in common. I was born in Houston, Texas, as well. Uh, oh. Sorry. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, uh, but I was born a lot earlier than you were. And so I was part of that whole uh, drama that happened around segregating the schools and the dragging of the feet. Um, also, Texas is where the school books are selected. That's, they are the, the state that determines what are in school books in the whole of the United States. Um, and that's something I've learned since then. So yes, I did not have an education around uh, African American or African culture at all growing up. Uh, the first pictures on the walls in my bedroom were, uh, my mother was a teach, my mother was an artist. Uh, she didn't get to actualize that in her life uh, because of the culture we live in. But after I was born, she was determined. She was constantly trying to manifest that part of herself. And so she went back to school, at Texas Southern University, to finish her fine art degree. We might be cousins. We might be. <laughs> We'll talk about that. <laughs> and um, she, uh, the first things I can remember smelling are her oil paints and her clay. Um, the pictures she put on the walls in my bedroom were uh, Velasquez Las Maninas. Um, I had Gainsborough's Blue Boy and three other classic white art paintings. Um, I was allowed to draw on the wall in my bedroom, and she would paint it out every month or two, and I could continue to draw on it again. So she was an extraordinary person, and so because she was so extraordinary, everything in society was against who she was, and she ended up having a nervous breakdown and disappearing from my life. But I want to tell you one little story when I was a little 
very little girl, um, and she was on the phone bragging. She and a friend were like bragging back and forth about how beautiful their babies were when they were born. <laughs> My, of course, I was more beautiful than her friend's baby. Her baby, her, her friend's baby was definitely more beautiful than me. But we were both beautiful babies, and I didn't know what the word born was yet. I was only like three, four years old. And I listened to this conversation, but I knew I had to have been really beautiful when I was born. And so when my mom got off the phone, I asked her. I took her into my bedroom, and I pointed at the, the infanta in Las Meninas, and I said, was that me when I was born? And so I tell you this story because at that very early age, I had already picked up that black, kinky hair, black person was not beautiful. So I uh, went to school, and my second to my last year in high school, the final, finally the Supreme Court, the, the law just came down hard on Texas, and they were like, you can't drag your feet anymore. You're going to have to desegregate the schools. So that year, they uh, had us, they bust us over to th those of us they considered academically able. Uh, the honor students. They bust us over to a white school and had us spend the week there and see if we would be interested in going to that school. And that was a breaking point for me. Up to that point, as you know, as I just said, I was an honor student. And that destroyed all of the confidence I had about my education and about my intelligence and my ability to uh, thrive in the world and excel. Uh, I finally realized why my school books ended at World War II, uh, because they only bought school books for the Caucasian schools, and then they would send us their old books. And that was also why uh, the students who were the honor students got a chance to go in first and pick all of our books, because we were trying to get the best books with the most pages in it because they knew we were going to actually read them and do our homework. So that, then I saw the gym. They had, a, um, they had an Olympic-sized sw swimming pool that was heated. And it was t a couple of decades later before I realized that the equipment that I was looking at was gymnastic equipment. Um, they had language labs, and everybody had earphones. In any case, there were five janitors, and we were always told that we were pigs because we had maybe some graffiti. Things weren't always great. The lockers weren't fixed. But I'm watching people painting lockers and repairing things and painting out writing on the wall. So it wasn't that we were that different, but we just didn't have the support. We didn't have five janitors. We only had one. And there were five times as many kids at our school than there were in their school. And that was the other thing. There were only 20. 25 kids in a class at the most, and there could be 30 to 40 kids in my classes. So that uh, ruined my, my, uh, my self-esteem. And um, I ended up, because my father's family had taken me in after my mother had her nervous breakdown, where my father grew up in Texas, no African American could go to school after fifth grade. So they, of course, were not conscious of scholarship. I mean, these were hardworking people. They had their own businesses. Uh, shoe re my dad was a shoe repairman, but he actually owned a lot of property. He would just buy buildings. And many. there were several times when um, the, what is it, where they take your land away? Um, no. domain. In, they, they declared imminent domain several times and took some of his property, but he still ended up uh, being able to leave his children um, something when he died. Um, but I chose other paths. I still stayed with my creativity. I went to a junior college, and when I came out, I decided I wanted to work in advertising, and I got a job as a glorified secretary. It was called an account assistant at an advertising agency. And uh, I told the people in personnel that when I left there, I would be an account executive on the biggest uh, account in the agency. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, then I left there and worked on the client side for Levi Strauss as one of their advertising directors. And uh, in all of these jobs, I was one of only maybe three black people in the building. 
And as I came back to who I was and when I inherited the money from my father, I decided to start making things, making art. And uh, the first things I decided to make was some furniture for my own home. Um, and as a result of that, because all of my friends were art directors, photographers, and stylists, they started renting uh, my furniture for shoots. And they put it together a portfolio for me, and they started commissioning custom work for me. And that's how that part of my career started. Um, and I have decided that I am free despite not being free, and I do whatever the hell I want to do. <laughs> so um, I don't have to be within any bounds because those bounds are too small for me, and I, I will go crazy like my mother did if I stay within where I'm supposed to be and do what I'm supposed to do. So no, I do not have an advanced degree, but it is my goal to make sure that artists of color are profitable and free to be creatively uh, expressive because they are earning money, because we need money. Artists, the struggling and starving artists scenario is not for me. And that was something my family was very, they pushed back a lot on the idea of my being an artist. And I forgive them, because what example did they have of a successful black female mm -hmm. artist. You know, I mean, you may have seen five black men, but you're, the women, no, did not exist in our, in our life. So I uh, <clears throat> have now taken on uh, placing the art of emerging and mid-career African-American artists in the homes of African-American collectors and getting them into museums and into galleries. Um, so that's my side gig that I do, and in the meantime, I continue to make my work. And I don't have an institution or gallery, and I sell stuff all the time, and I just have my own shows, or I participate in, in group things that other artists put together, and, uh, and I live a really beautiful life. So I want to get right to the heart of the question that you all asked. Um, how was my experience as a student um, affected by a lack of representation? It accounts for why I'm sitting here. Because I was confronted with three things. I was confronted with uh, the crater, the charge, and the commitment. Um, the crater is this incalculable, incalculable amount of illiteracy, ignorance, indifference, and innocence among people who hold BFA and MFA degrees, either as students or as faculty or administrators, in the matter of the intersections between race, class, gender, and how they account for segregation, within art and within the worlds beyond art. And I think it's important for everyone in the room to understand that white supremacy is not about white persons. <clears throat> I'm gonna say that again so you can exhale. <laughs> white supremacy is not about white persons and Bell Hooks uh, has a much more a prosaic way of saying the same thing um, in talking back, talking feminist, talking black, which you all should read. It's best to think of white supremacy as the answer to a centuries old question. Is the African part of the human family? And consistently, the answer to that question has been no. And it's important to understand the role that the academy, higher education, has played in providing people with evidence, however pseudoscientific it may be, however faulty it might be, but providing evidence for that answer being no. 
the role of visual culture is critical in that answer being no, because we have centuries of representations that provide this comparison between uh, so-called um, uh, persons and property. And it's an important thing to understand that. So that was the first thing I was confronted with when I was in uh, my BFA education and then my uh, graduate education. This crater of ignorance, illiteracy, indifference, and innocence that is so huge that it's incalculable. You can't measure how deep it is. And then it was a charge. I was in graduate school, and it was a young woman in one of my seminars who, uh, to make a long story short, uh, wanted to have a debate with me about the irrelevance of race in uh, my life and in her life and in, in, in the United States of America. <laughs> and she wanted this debate to be part of her, or to be the subject of her thesis film in cinema. So she was a senior about to leave the Ohio State University uh, with a, uh, armed with a weapon of mass destruction. And so we had a talk and I said, okay, if race is so irrelevant in the United States and in my life, tell me why there's so few tenured African-American professors at the Ohio State University. She said, oh, that's easy to explain. There are more whites in the population. So, I said, okay. So then I said, if the preponderance of white people in the population explain their dominance in the academy, why are the majority of players in the National Basketball Association <laughs> black? And she actually thought before she answered me and said, they're better at that. So here I was, black man in an apartment in Columbus, Ohio, with a young white woman who was about to complete four to five years of formal education with the 17th century ideas about the correspondence between skin color and intelligence and superiority because either no one had challenged them or had done so successfully. And then the voice came to me. What are you going to do about this? And I was in an MA program in photography and cinema at The Ohio State University. And it was clear to me that and I taught the entire two years that I was there. I taught, the, uh, I taught an introduction to photography course. And I had all of these students, most of them, young, white farm children, who more often than not, I was the first black person in the role of professor for them. And uh, more often than not, I would be asked the question, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I never said teacher. And one student literally came to me and said, you are a teacher. You should find a place in the academy. And I didn't hear them until I heard this young woman say what she said. And so what this meant is that I had to get the terminal degree. Uh, and uh, I applied to the Maryland Institute College of Art where I got my MFA. And that's when the commitment came. The commitment to being part of the solution uh, and not part of the problem. And uh, to um, honor, honor those young people who essentially put me into a command performance in the classroom in ways that I never, ever expected. And 
it was also the beginning of a commitment to something that uh, Martin Luther King said, um, 1967, where he talked about, I think it was an NAACP uh, address that he gave, where he talked about the importance that the future, the future is to the maladjusted. And one of the things that I came to understand was that being in the academy is to be in the midst of people who have adjusted to the idea that the African is not part of the human family. And that intellectual property of any significance could not come from anybody who was a descendant of that continent. And so aside from making a commitment to producing visual culture that challenged these representations of African American people specifically as either criminals, entertainers, or athletes, and even within those representations not being perceived oftentimes as human, it was important for me to contribute to the scholarship. And I was fortunately, fortunately at the Ohio State University, I never ever thought I'd ever get misty-eyed talking about an uh, institution I was associated with, but I get misty-eyed talking about the Ohio State University because it was there, <clears throat> excuse me, I was treated like a basketball player. I was, recruit, I, was, I was recruited, I was courted, I was accepted, I was, capital, I was monetized through having a tuition waiver the entire time I was there, I was paid to teach, but I was also charged, I was also charged by my faculty to come in the classroom and to disrupt the flow of discourse that was taking place. I was one of the first people on the, the campus that had the first, the first Apple Power Book. And um, I had a, a uh, history of photography professor, Clyde Dilley, God bless him. Um, so when I told him I got it, he says, well, you're going to bring it to the classroom, right? I said, yeah. I said, what am I going to do with it in the classroom? He said, well, you're going to take notes. I said, well, Clyde, I can't, I can't type that fast. He said, don't worry. You'll catch up. And this was the man who said, you cannot leave what you say in this seminar. You must write. And you must get what you've written published. Because if you don't do this, you're... Classmates won't. If you don't make these points, your classmates will not. So this is why I said white supremacy is not about white persons. And it's important to understand that uh, that, that framework, that framework is ideological, but it's also on some levels biological and, or psychological, more to the, more to the point because there are people who cannot unlearn this. And um, I'm here today uh, to play a role in helping people unlearn it. Uh, through my own work as, a, as an artist, working in photography and cinema, and as a, an essayist that helps people um, make sense of uh, the madness that we find ourselves in. Thank you, everyone, for that. Um, so moving on to this idea of representation and supply and demand. Um, each summer, the SVA library withdraws from circulation some books, um, which include a catalog from a Charles Alston show, survey of work from 1936 to 1969, selected poems by Gwendolyn Brooks, um, just black authors. <laughs> and Shailene made this known to me. Um, and so our question to you is, um, are libraries meant to reflect student bodies or shape them? And it's very clear that SVA, being thousands, 
thousands of dollars for tuition isn't accessible to many communities, and so we wonder how our libraries are supposed to be shaped. I, I would say first, um, go to the library. When I say go to the library, I don't mean go to Google. Google is a database. Um, it's an index of websites. All information about human history, all of human history is not on the internet. Not even close. So go to the library. Um, and also the, the concept, well the concept of the academy really is about certifying what is significant and reproducing knowledge about what is significant. So it is not um, in its function meant to be demo democratic. It's not meant to be de uh, democratic. It's not meant to um, equalize relations of power in society. In fact, it's meant to uh, maintain the stratification of power in society. So part of our frustration about the exclusion of uh, historically marginalized groups from academic discourse is because we um, have this mitigated acceptance, right? The more that marginalized communities are disruptive and demand to be included, you know, we get a little concession here, a little concession there, and that concession is also meant to stabilize the existing relations of power in society. So we get a little bit of ethnic studies, a little bit of gay and lesbian studies, et cetera, um, and that's just supposed to be enough to keep us from burning the whole thing down. I am not saying burn anything down, <laughs> just to be clear, but that is the fear, right? Nobody, you know, everything's fun and games until the guillotine shows up. Start marching. <laughs> no, the marching is fine. It's the guillotine that's the problem, yeah. right? I mean, which it should be. Nobody wants that, of course. So, um, so the library, right, follows that same function, right? Libraries are meant to certify what is important and reproduce that significance over time, right? So. Um, it is incredible if you go to a library that's been going since, you know, the 18th century and you can see, okay, for some of you, many moons ago before searches on the internet, you had something called a card catalog. <laughs> and actually, many libraries have not placed everything in their card catalogs online. So you still need to go and look in the card catalog. Right? And so you will see, oh, the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, Douglass, comma, Frederick, 1863, when it first came out. Right? And so some libraries were, had some abolitionist librarian, right, um, who would order the book. And so then it's there for subsequent generations to find. But the great thing about the academic library is that it is uh, customer service oriented many times. So if you as a student or a professor request things for the library, librarians will generally get them. If you check out things from the library, librarian will keep them. So it's not to say that there isn't necessarily a bias Right? There is an association of African-American librarians. They meet every year. There's about 1,000 of them. Um, but part of what we can do to certify what's significant is by raising our voice and, um, and using things. Right? And that's a part that we can play. And so that's also about, you know, sure, you can just watch things on Netflix. Like you hear about something like, um, there's this great documentary, Cuba Libre, which is about the history of the Cuban Revolution, right? You can watch it on Netflix, but um, who knows how long Netflix is gonna last mm -hmm. if you're talking about from 1863 till now, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so maybe you can request 
something that you see that's on Netflix that's about your community that you think is relevant, and they'll get it on DVD, or they'll get the digital stream of it, and it will be there, right? So it's not up to us to just accept what's certified as important when we're in these institutions. We also have a say, and it's really, if we want things to be different, if we want to have um, more inclusion, then we have to lead. Which is not to say that we're displacing responsibility, right, or saying, okay, well, the librarian has no responsibility, but it is meant to be an interactive process, and we should take advantage of that, I think. Are we doing this down the line thing again? Um, when Shaleen told me that this was happening at SVA, um, I just thought this was crazy. <laughs> this is crazy. It's, it's crazy to, uh, to, to discontinue Black Writers of America, a contemporary anthology by Richard Barksdale, uh, Kenneth Kinneman, uh, a catalog from a Charles Alston show, survey of work from 1936 to 1969, selected poems by Gwendolyn Brooks. Come on. That's crazy. Um, Introduction to African Civilizations by John, uh, by John G. Jackson, forward by John Henry Clark. I didn't know anything about John Henry Clark until I started hanging out with a girl from Cornell who had studied oh. under Dr. Turner at the okay. Africana Studies uh, program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these these uh, academic spaces that we are, um, oh, biographies on Lorraine Hansberry and uh, uh, Octavio Paz. I'm going to throw that out. On the street. Like this is you're just there. This is what's being pulled from the library and, and and made inaccessible to incoming students. So Shalina and I talked about this a little bit. And what's interesting about this is, it's like, well, if you're coming from places, you know, so like even as a beneficiary of like great public and private education, there's like all this stuff that I don't know that I'm still like having to like learn and teach myself, um, in good company now. Um, so how would I know? that I don't want this, or that I, do, that I need this or don't want this. If I'm coming right, if, if you're, and if you're coming into SVA as a, as a normal um, undergraduate, you're coming right out of high school from wherever, you know, like let's say you're coming from Arizona where you're not allowed to learn about Native Americans <laughs> in the textbooks. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's disallowed. You know what I mean? Like, like what, what is, like how is, like these are crazy decisions. These are crazy institutional decisions. And um, that's House Bill. 2281. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's like, what, what do you, I mean, this, it's just, it, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And then we who are the art students, so like my, like I can, I can primarily speak as someone who makes art and who's been, you know, like in public and private art education since I was a little girl. Um, uh, you know, we find ourselves as I've moved up, as I've like grown up um, and like, you know, crossed the country for this goal. Um, I have found that I've been in places um, where I thought that we were all, I thought we all wanted to be artists. I thought this was like, you no, know, like we, we made it. We're here together. Like this is what we want and, and found myself and other people of color kind of being, um, uh, well, just having really strange, strange experiences, strange dehumanizing experiences in spaces that are supposed to be you know, we're led to believe we're like, you know, heightened for creativity and intellectual discourse, like some really stupid stuff, like really stupid, basic, 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 like be beneath basic, um, like disrespectful, dehumanizing interactions that are born of what uh, Mr. Gaskins is talking about, this like, this core belief, this core disbelief that we actually belong there. You know, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, so, like, if so, if if that's the space, like, we should just get real about that. I mean, these are and these are conversations that many of us who have been through these academic spaces, um, you know, uh, we all know. And and when we're when we're we, we privately will 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 discuss it because we need support. And I, I think it's interesting in recent years. Um, well, in the last couple of years, there, there are so many, um, you know, contemporary campus demonstrations all over the country. What I found most interesting is that things that would normally only be discussed um, in closed company were, were being discussed openly about mm. these kinds of experiences. So it's like, it's just stupid. Like, this is how you breed stupidity, is all. This is just how you breed stupidity. And then we're the ones who have to deal with it when we're students. And then students of color, I mean, you know, the data already shows that those of us who, though, many of us will then take on extra work you know, doing like public work 
at school to try to, you know, cause like as, as uh, Mr. Gaskins was saying, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? She just did. Yeah. <laughs> doing this panel right yeah what are you going to do about it yeah so so we we do all this 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 extra lifting which is you know can produce these beautiful things yes mm -hmm. but then when we leave institutional amnesia sets in yes. and then you have a whole nother a whole nother generation who's coming in without without uh the, the uh like a full breadth of humanism even being prioritized in the way that they're learning about social history human history and cultural history and it's insane Um, just a brief note, ushers are going to come around to collect questions for the Q&A right now. Just look out for them. Like, if people um, are supposed to be smart, like, why would you do that? <laughs> oh, so those books, uh, they didn't get tossed. They're in my library at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you raise your hand, um, if you haven't got an index card, an usher will find you. Um, he's asking... We'll, 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 we'll get to that. We'll get to your question. Yeah. Uh, so the library was a lifesaver for me. I, I literally get sexually turned on uh, around a lot of books <laughs> and actually have had sex in the library several times. So, but I, and I was, my intention was to read the entire encyclopedia. I was just, I was an only child, and so books were my, uh, my refuge from everything that was going around in the chaos of my life. Um, so, but I did notice as I was going through school that there was less and there was not a lot about my, my life and my family and, and, the African American experience, or even something for me to be really super proud of, uh, even though in my life I saw it all the time. Because the flip side of segregation is that we were all together in every socioeconomic group. So even though my family was working class, my friends, because of my academic achievement, were the kids whose fathers and mothers were doctors, lawyers, professors. And so I got to experience a bigger life, which kids now don't get to do because the smarter, wealthier kids are going to private school or they are in charter schools. And so those who are left behind are literally left behind. And so that was the advantage for me. So I absolutely loved it, but I also felt a great deal of frustration around it. But what I did learn is to, to, I learned how to communicate uh, in the language and in the metaphors that my Caucasian colleagues and friends could understand because that was pretty much what my education had been from that, from that viewpoint. So, uh, for instance, I've been on some boards. I was on the first board in America, the first organization in America that was a site-specific artist residency program. It's called Cap Street Project in San Francisco. I was on the board of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the chair of their Society for the Encouragement of Contemporary Art, which chooses artists uh, to get a show in the museum every two years. and. Um, in all of those situations, because I could translate my thoughts using the metaphors of Shakespeare or someone else uh, to my colleagues on the board, because I was typically the only African American on the board, uh, that really was enabled me to to have my agenda go through. So. Fred Wilson got a, a residency at Cap Street, and Willie Cole, and these were people that I just said to the board, like, why haven't, you know, I've been on the board for three years, and we've gotten artists from all over Europe and America and everywhere, but I haven't seen any African Americans, so I need to see some. And always, the way I like to flip it was they would ask me, uh, you know, to go out and find uh, you know, more black blood board members or more uh, black artists, and I would flip that back to them. And I knew that was why they had asked me to come on the board, but my agenda was bigger. My, my goal was for them to find 
African American artists and more African Americans to be on the board because they needed to open up their uh, their their circle of who was in their life, and it enriched everybody by doing that. So, getting back to the library. It enriches everybody. The more knowledge that's in those repositories, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, there's so much uh, joy, there's so much knowledge, there are so many inventions that African Americans have contributed to this country that the real McCoy is a black man who developed a patent for a, a, a process for oiling the railroads at a time when the railroad was the most important means of getting anything done in this country. So to have a real McCoy meant that you actually had his and not a knockoff of his invention. So there's a lot of things like this that is kept from everybody, and we should all know it. So that is why I think that it's important for libraries to include everybody, and, and not just African Americans, but everybody should be included in our canon, uh, it, it shouldn't be only white and European because that's, that's a small world and it's not an exciting and interesting world and it doesn't challenge you. And you can't grow and you can't really have joy and fun and certainly not great sex. <laughs> Cheryl, I think there's going to be an increased participation and in number of people going to the library here. <laughs> because of you. I want to say something. In the same way, how many people here go to parties and dance? Raise your hands. OK. In the same way, you would leave a party if Beyonce wasn't being spun, and Jay-Z wasn't being spun, and Young Jeezy wasn't being spun, and the same way, <laughs> same way you would turn around and see something problematic with that party. You have to have the same attitude about intellectual property and scholarship. You have got to begin to ask the question, what were black, brown, and red people, and what are black, brown, and red people thinking as critical spectators and critical producers of visual and material culture and design. In the same way you know you're going to miss something if that beat is not at that party, I'm telling you, you're missing a great deal if you're not answering that or asking that question. And the, the thing that separated me from my colleagues in undergraduate school as well as graduate school is simply I asked that question. And I, I am extraordinarily enriched and have been extraordinarily enriched by asking that simple question. Because while the academy in the li and the libraries went to, will silo knowledge in certain ways. That's not how knowledge works. And the library within art and design schools has a peculiar relationship. Because you have people who are in studio courses, teaching in studio courses, that m divide the visual arts from the liberal arts. And leave students with the, 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 the mistaken impression that the work comes from them, and that innovation comes from them, and that uh, originality comes from them, when it really comes from, as I tell my students all the time when we talk about photography, photography is an interdisciplinary medium that requires an interdisciplinary approach to its reception and its production. So what that means at the end of the day is you have to choose a conversation in design, in photography, in cinema, in painting, in whatever medium you're working with, 
and understand that it's, in, it's not informed by photography. It's not informed by cinema. It's not informed by design for design's sake. It's informed by ideas outside of it. And aside from you know, a site for sexual encounter, um, so, many of the, so many of the situations that you find yourself stuck in, in terms of the work that you're producing, you can get yourselves unstuck uh, by getting as much information as you possibly can and ask the, those questions, what have black, brown, and red people been thinking about in terms of the discipline that I'm in? Now, you will be confronted by people who are in the role of professor who may tell you nothing. They've not asked those questions. And it's up to you to uh, be intrepid and contradict that response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we want to try to get in a couple more questions uh, before we wrap for the evening. Um, I'm going to throw two very important questions out there, and let's try to be succinct with our answers. Um, um, one, departments within universities bear the responsibility of undoing dated and exclusionary knowledge with white supremacists and imperialist underpinnings. Because we have a legacy of exclusionary learning, there is an army of scholars, academics, and teachers that have spent their whole career with no knowledge of non-Western intellectual and avant-garde contributions. Is it time for institutions to send their faculties back to school? That's one. The second, the name of this panel is Erasure by Exclusion. Exclusion in this case is not meant to automatically imply inclusion as in assimilation. Inclusion in this case is meant as a way to not be rendered as extinct to not be negated, it is a demand. With this in mind, we would like to ask, Anastasia and I would like to ask, uh, what are the differences between diversity and equality, and how do these words present themselves in the art system? All right, I'm just tossing it out there, somebody catch that. <laughs> I will say uh, very quickly, um, Yes, it is time. For, it's always time for faculty to go back to school. I mean, I think part of something I get very frustrated with is whenever there is an incident um, uh, of, of racism. I mean, at my institution, uh, sadly, uh, after Trump's election, uh, someone or some people put swastikas on the doors of several students' uh, dorm rooms. Um, and so then there's a conversation about let's have training, right? And, um, and then, but the training is not for decision makers about how to uh, have the best possible campus climate. It's not a training about what are the, uh, for, for the leadership of an institution, what are solutions that have worked, what steps have other institutions taken, how much money have they spent um, it falls to the faculty and the students to fix the problem when they have the least amount of resources and decision-making power to do so. Can we clap? Right? <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, again, how power in all institutions work, right? Things, uh, the scatological goes downhill, right? And so um, it is, it's really important to hold the decision makers accountable because they can change the most, the fastest, right? And so in terms of going back to school, you know, training is something that should be happening for the campus all the time, for faculty at different stages of careers, for students, and that should be embedded in the institution. It shouldn't be a one-off when there's a crisis. Yeah. So yes, everyone needs to be thinking about uh, structures of inequality, thinking about race, thinking about the contributions of communities of color and how they are essential to our understanding of everything. I don't know how many people saw Hidden Figures, but I was like, oh, so I didn't know anything about NASA then. <laughs> I, really, I didn't. I didn't know anything about NASA because if you didn't know about the gendered nature, the gender segregation of labor, mm -hmm. 
and you didn't know how Jim Crow was affecting knowledge production of NASA, you didn't know anything about NASA. And so we're doing a disservice to knowledge in general by excluding these stories, um, as Bill was just saying. So that's one. And then two, I, I struggle with div the concepts of diversity and equality. Diversity, because I said before, right, if you have, rep you can have representation that is different, but no difference in opinion, no difference in concern, right? And we see that when we see Omarosa and Ben Carson sitting with Donald Trump, right, talking about black history. Get Frederick Douglass's name out of your mouth. Like, don't, don't say Rosa Parks, don't. Um, so you can have a, a, a wonderful buffet, right, but then you look closely and it's just all green beans, you know? I mean, some are curried, some are sauteed, some are deep fried, but a green bean is a green bean. And so how much difference does it really make, right? The most diverse pageant in the world is the Miss Universe pageant, right? Miss Angola, Miss Philippines, Miss Switzerland. But, you know, everyone is five, eight or above. Everyone is 120 pounds or less. Everyone has long, straight hair. Everyone has a certain eye to nose to chin ratio, right? So I, I don't, diversity in this time, I don't know how meaningful it is in terms of advancing and achieving democracy, in terms of relations of power, right? In terms of enabling and sustaining autonomy, helping us have the resources we need to make the best decisions for ourselves and the people we care about, right? And that is what, if we think about, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes, we think about racism as, as policies and practices that cause premature death for people of color, then the opposite is what can cause long life, right? And diversity alone doesn't get us there. And that leads me to my problems with equality, right? Because the premise of so many of the, of the affirmative action programs, which I'm proud to say I have participated in, in, in life. I mean, if it's good enough for the Bushes, it's good enough for me. Um, if it's good enough for the Hiltons, it's good enough for me. Um, uh, so, so, but so much of the, the, the premise of these programs, whether it's the Better Chance program, um, or you know, I was, had a four diversity dissertation fellowship, the idea is that the, the institution is fine, the system is fine, if only you can have the access Right? If only you can have the opportunity, then you know, you'll be good. Right? But we know that that is not the case. Right? The opioid epidemic in this country is really catching fire in middle class white neighborhoods. What's going on that young people don't want to be awake? Don't want to walk in consciousness in the suburbs? Right? Something is, in some ways, I think mainstream American culture, like I don't know if anybody's ever been to Orange County. <laughs> I'm talking too long. But so, but equality, the, the, the basic uh, presumption of equality is that everything is okay as the further up you go on the social ladder. And there is no really compelling evidence that that's the case, mm -hmm. right? Having money only solves not having money. Right, um, and so that is something that I think about. So I think to me, the real key to change is about what can we do to increase autonomy? What can we do to democratize resources? Those are the keys to expanding life. And that's where historically there's all kinds of resistance, you know, like uh, exp uh, um, resources. Mm -hmm. um, under resourcing specific communities and then blaming them for their blightedness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I just want to, I, I want to read something, this quote from uh, this uh, really smart man, um, uh, because I feel like it's really fitting. Um, he said, all I have been doing in trying to correct the system in America has been in vain. For the vast majority of white Americans, the past decade, the first phase, had been a struggle to treat the Negro with a degree of decency, not equality. White America was ready to demand that the Negro be spared the lash of brutality and coarse degradation. 
but it had never truly committed to helping them out of poverty, exploitation, and, and all forms of discrimination. When Negroes looked for the second phase, the realization of equality, they, or we, found that many of their white allies had quietly disappeared. The Negroes of America had taken the president, the press, and the pulpit at their word when they spoke in broad terms of freedom and justice. But the absence of brutality, um, but the absence of brutality and un, uh, un, uh, unre un unregenerate evil is not the presence of justice. To stay murder is not the same thing as to obtain personhood. Mm -hmm. Why is equality so assiduously avoided? Why does white America delude itself and how, and how does it rationalize the evil it retains? There is not even a common language when the term equality is used. Negro and white have a fundamentally different definition. Negroes have precedented, have, uh, have uh, proceeded from a, a premise that equality means, that it's, uh, means what it says and have taken white America at its word when they talked of it as an objective. But most whites in America in 1967, including many persons of goodwill, proceed from a premise that equality is a loose expression for improvement. Loose and easy language about equality, resonant resolutions about personhood uh, fall pleasantly on the ear. But for the Negro, there is a credibility gap that they cannot overlook, that we cannot overlook. They remembered that with each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that the Negro has come far enough. Each step forward ascends an ever-present tendency to backlash. Mm -hmm. That was Dr. King speaking in 1967. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So bad. I'm like really for this accountability <laughs> thing. Um, but... Uh, yeah, like uh, accountability inside of the schools. I mean, you know, like the school, the, 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 the desegregation of public space, um, the, the desegregation of schools was the Trojan horse that, tr that transformed all of public space as we know it. Interstate transportation, all of that. Public parks, you know, buildings, uh, all of that. All of that happened. The battlefield was, was, the, edu was the space of education. The battlefield was the mind. And um, you know, Thurgood Marshall knew when he was a child that he wanted to desegregate education, sitting in the backs of court. His father had him sitting in the backs of courtrooms quietly listening. And he knew when he was a child that that was, that that was the key. And for Dr. King, doc, the, the, the key that Dr. King found before he was assassinated, I mean, he'd been talking about it since 1957, but um, was the link between labor and racial equality. Um, uh, uh, and justice, labor and justice. You know, the, the, the fact that we, the way that we see ourselves is born of the work that we do. Um, whether that be scholarly or, or, ma or manual labor. You know, like that determines like our sense of self and our place in our community, our ability to, to care for each other and for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's humanism. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, there just needs, I mean, yeah, we, we should all be learning all the time. The space of education is, was the opportunity, thought Thurgood Marshall and the, uh, and the, and the LDF, um, especially early childhood education was the place to really get in there, get in there early to stop that cycle of, um, of, of, of inherent racism, um, of anti-black, anti-brown, um, uh, the, the terror of racism from, from repeating. Um, that, you know, studies showed a long time ago uh, that children of color bear the brunt of that. You know, like everybody is affected. Every, everybody is walking around with, this, with a completely distorted sense of reality and the value of human life. But the, but the pain, the real, like, long-term pain, the life-altering pain is often endured by communities of color who are getting it from all sides. So, like, the, the space of education is, like, is, is the opportunity for us to be together and to learn and to advance and to grow. And it should be fun. Like, it should be fun. Like for everybody involved, I think, including mm -hmm. the facilitators. I mean, I had fun when I finally got into some African, uh, um, some AFAM studies classes at Yale. We had fun, you know, pulling stuff apart, like learning about people that we should we should have already known about. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody needs that, you know. Every everybody needs that for you know for a you know for a, a life uh, for a beautiful life. Mm -hmm. Every like we all we all need that.
Well, I, I really think that uh, diversity is extremely important, and especially the power uh, silos of this country. And um, I've seen it, I've seen it in, in, at work in my encouraging uh, the boards that I've been on, the, the companies I've worked for to diverse, to be more diverse. And when I look at diversity, I, I, I mean it in every way uh, because it just improves everything. It, if everybody is the same, then everybody has the same blind spot. And so by bringing in other points of views, other income levels, other sexes, and other races of people, you're going to have a much better organization, business, board, neighborhood, school, because you are going to get the best from everything. You're going to get things that you never experienced and didn't know anything about. You're going to meet amazing and interesting people. Um, as far as equality, I don't know if that's possible for human, the human condition, to create anything that's really equal. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of hope for equality, but I do have a lot of hope for diversity because that's something that we can definitely do and so easily too. Um, you know, if you're looking, if you're sitting in any situation and you look around and everyone is black or everyone is uh, Caucasian males, then you need to get in action immediately and change that dynamic up because you're going to have much more success if you bring in a lot more diversity to any type of endeavor that you're going to reach to. And I've seen this countless, so many times now in my life that I know that I'm speaking the truth. <clears throat> the most devastating and persistent human action in the history of humankind was the transatlantic slave trade. That benefited the United States and Great Britain to the extent that the Profit, I mean, the interest on that profit is still being born. It's important to understand the history of this term diversity. So, quickly, first Africans get here, Jamestown, Virginia, in 1619. So, this unmitigated hell between 1619, not only unmitigated hell, but there is a, an agreement within American culture that we won't talk about the peculiar institution of slavery. May, uh, excuse me, uh, April 4th, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That was the moment when the United States of America, its citizens, began to understand that something had happened. That, that there was a past grievance that was structural in its nature. It wasn't about personalities. It was structural. And so 1968 began a particular period of time. First, there was violence. And there are certain people who can hear violence in ways that they can't hear dialogue or please. These people started to do something because they realized that something had happened that we haven't been talking about. 
So that ends in 1978 with the Supreme Court case, Bakke versus University of California. This is a case where a man by the name of Alan Bakke uh, sues the regents of the University of California for his being denied access or entrance into the uh, UCAL Davis Medical School. The brief written by uh, Justice John Paul Stevens basically said this. I'm stripping away all the legalese. While there have been efforts over the last 10 years to address past grievances and past injustices, in the matter of higher education, we can no longer desegregate based on past injustice. We can only do it for purposes of diversity. So basically what that comes down to is that I will allow you in my corporation. I will allow you in my school. I will allow you in my fellowship programs. Now, even though something happened to you, the deal is you can't talk about it. I'll give you everything you want. I'll put you in positions of influence, but you can't talk about what was done to you. So diversity amounts to a vague, conflict averse, race evasive, ahistorical celebration of difference that is a, it's an administrative and legal tool to keep people from facing the fact that something has happened that is inexorably connected to the contradictions between the principles and the platitudes for which this country is built on and its policies and practices in the matter of those descendants of chattel slavery in the United States. And it's important to understand that's the history of this term. It's legal and it's, and it's, it's administrative. Mm. And it serves a purpose that keeps people innocent, illiterate, ignorant, and indifferent. So um, I think we'll have one or two more of our questions before we move on to the Q&A. Do we have uh, time? I, th no, I think we may have run out of time a little bit. <laughs> one more question before the Q&A? Do we have time for one more? Do you want to stay? <laughs> you want to stay? Do you want to mix and match? All right. Q&A. Okay. Okay. Can we All right. to the card? Yeah, okay, sure, sure. We'll come back. All right. Okay. So. Wait, wait a second. They have. Um, and I really identify with this question being a current student and having this experience of the Room of Silence, whoever brought us this question. Being black in an art critique can be challenging to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Referred to commonly amongst POC as the re Room of Silence, I feel like my artistic growth is being stifled because being in a class full of white artists, they never have much to say about work outside of aesthetics. How can this atmosphere be challenged as a student? First, I would recommend that you read Institutional Time by Judy Chicago and understand that, <clears throat> excuse me, the history of the art academy is that it has, it was gendered feminine. It was a place for women. And not all the time was it a place for women to be professionalized beyond a particular group of siloed 
practices like interior design uh, and other craft-based um, mediums. It's important to understand that post-war America brings us the imprimatur of abstract expressionism informed by bebop here in New York City. Not jazz. <laughs> it's informed by bebop. And so you have all of these white men who are coming back from the war who have access to the GI Bill that enables them to have access to higher education paid for by the government. So many of these people come into schools of art and they proceed to recover art from its feminine identity. So this convention you all are experiencing in your critiques, I don't care what d discipline you're in, that it's uh, a caged uh, battle match. <laughs> yes. That, that is all about this particular period of time in the 1940s where these white men come in and basically set the terms of dialogue and discourse around the critique of work that amounts to this question, are you man enough to be in here? And that's to an overwhelming majority of women who are the students. And so, first of all, you don't get paid. First of all, if you want therapy, the critique is not the place for that. And more to the point, it is not the place for anybody to abuse you. It is not the place for, their, uh, for there to be the absence of verifiable criteria for the evaluation of your work. That is what we have here. It's what I call a legacy pedagogy. And it's serving very few people. And what it does is it, it conditions students to be on eggshells. And more to the point, it conditions students to say what people want to hear you say, do what some people want you to do, and rather than put you into position to animate develop your work on your terms. And it's important that you understand what that's about. And one of the things that has to stop, going back to the point about people being educated, <clears throat> BFA and MFA education is perhaps the only place I'm aware of where people are in roles as educators who have no coursework in pedagogy, have no coursework in curricular development, and have no coursework in organizational psychology. So basically, they're teaching the way they've been taught. And that model is this implicit question, are you man enough to be in here? And so this whole idea of having to come into a critique and be destroyed as a, uh, as a matter of course, as a matter of professional development is false. And uh, you need to disrupt it. Preach. So um, the next question, it's one of our questions and it's, seems to be a really popular one amongst the ones you guys submitted. Um, so there is a painting in question. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it up to you whether or not you would like to name the artist. Um, 
But our question is, why does art by white artists featuring black subjects continue to be so problematic? Um, and why does it always fall short of its intentions? Uh, what does it mean to be in the image and what does it mean to produce it? So just, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. But I, I have been thinking so much about this because I actually, I mean, we're talking about, is it Dana Schutz? Yes. Schutz. Dana Schutz, and I've only seen, I haven't seen it in person, I've only seen photographs of it. And I teach, um, I teach about the murder of Emmett Till, and there's a brilliant documentary called The Murder of Emmett Till that if you're interested in the subject matter, I highly recommend you watch. And I teach the photograph, um, uh, the photograph that was featured in Jet Magazine of his mutilated, disfigured body, um, because it was, as many of you may know, this lightning rod for um, uh, participation in the civil rights movement. And many young people who would go on to be in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and do sit-ins and, and go to the South and mobilize uh, and work with African-American communities in the South to uh, register to vote and demand the right to vote, as teens, they saw that photograph of Emmett Till in Jet Magazine, the great Jet Magazine. Go to the library, but it's also on Google. That's on Google. <laughs> if you want to have a really good time enjoying black aesthetics of the late 20th century, just look at old Jet on Google. It's a really great way to spend a rainy Saturday. And so, um, and so and I teach that photograph, and a part of the reason that I teach the photograph is because of his mother, Mamie Till. And so when Mamie Till, you know, they demand the body, they demand the body, the body is brought back to one of the great African-American institutions, the funeral home, which that's a whole other panel, um, is brought to the south side of the Chicago, the funeral home, and the mortician you know, a stalwart of, of the community, as all funeral homes are, the mortician says, you do not want to see him. I'm gonna get emotional. You do not want to see him. And she's determined, yes, I do. Right? And so she insists, and probably against his better judgment, he concedes to the wishes of the mother. And she can't believe what she saw. She can't believe it. And if you've seen the photographs of him before he goes to Mississippi, before he is falsely accused, there's a great book out by Timothy Tyson about the white woman who admits finally 50, 60 years later that she lied about the whistle. Who cares a whistle anyway? But she lied about that. He had done nothing. She can't believe what she sees, and the mortician, in sympathy, begins to talk about, I think it has to be a closed casket. I don't know what I can do to restore him, because he's mutilated so viciously. And she says, it will be an open casket. And I, you know, this everyone should see. So the photograph in Jet Magazine is a political act, which is to say so many times African Americans endure terror, endure violence, is motivated by white supremacy that is meant to show us our place in society, and we just take it because we're afraid that saying something about it, telling the truth about it, is just going to invite more violence. And that has been the case since we got here to Jamestown, right? And so when Mamie Till says, from the relative safety of Chicago, right, from the relative safety of being a, a middle-aged woman, we will tell the truth about what happened to my son. It is political and is, it is not filtered. If you see the actual photograph, which is easily, you can see, you can see that on Google and you can see what he looked like before. It's gruesome, and it's devastating, and it's courageous. It's courageous of Jet Magazine to publish the photograph, right? So my reaction to the painting was that it wasn't gruesome enough, right? If you're going to show 
this suffering, and that is your intention to tell the truth about racial terror, tell the truth. The swirls, for those of us who are not African American studies professors who have not seen it closely, don't convey the reality of the terror. And so to me, that was my criticism. Not that she didn't have a right to portray the event, not that you know, a white person doesn't have the right to discuss these things, but if you're flinching, you're really violating Mamie Till's intention. And that is disrespect. Show the image in its, in its violence. Show the truth of the violence. But also, why not, as a white woman, relate directly to your personal history as a white woman in the event? Right. Which is not to say, you know, show the violence of the accuser or the violence that she was subjected to in terms of being coerced into being an accuser, which doesn't, not, don't, don't jump me, I'm not trying to say she's not responsible, right? But y there is a whole story there. Mm -hmm. Why not use your privilege to tell a part of the story that is very confrontational? right, but extremely important for us to understand and perhaps encourage people in your community as a white woman to make different choices, right? So again, your art is your art. I'm big on freedom of speech, right? We're gonna need freedom of speech now more than ever. It's been 60 days. We need, so I'm big on freedom of speech, and I, but I'm also big on criticism that advances solutions. So I think to say to someone, well, you don't have a right to speak about racism because you're white is absurd and unhelpful. To stay only in anger without an actual conversation about what people can do differently doesn't advance anything. And so I'm fearful that the conversation that has emerged is going to discourage white artists from having any kind of conversation or participation. And I hope that that doesn't happen. Well, you know, I, th I, 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 the freedom thing is very important, all right? But I think at the same time, there needs to be responsibility. And one of the things that often happens within studio art curriculum fostered by faculty mm -hmm. who, will, who will justify not going to the library mm -hmm. on the principle of academic freedom. Mm. So I'm free to be ignorant. <laughs> I'm free to be innocent. I'm free to be illiterate. Mm -hmm. And so I think that all, uh, all too often students uh, uh, are not encouraged and mandated to be responsible for visual culture. A very important essay you all should read is called Abstract Expressionism, Weapon of the Cold War, first sentence, to understand what makes a particular art movement successful is to understand the, the particulars of patronage mm -hmm. and the ideological needs of the powerful. So this thing you all are doing, this, this, is, this is not playtime. You're, you're not in Mrs. Gustin's first grade class anymore. This stuff has power. And it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about understanding that you're living in a particular time where people need a clarifying effect through what you do. And it's not just for me about shoots. It's about the illiteracy of the entire supply chain. That's the director. That's the curators. That is the people connected to the education department there missing an opportunity to truly, truly 
uh, do something beyond what has become um, uh, a lightning rod and a distraction from all the other work within uh, the exhibition. But it reflects the fact that she came from and through an educational system that says you, can you, are, you can do whatever you want. And with whomever's body, with whomever's right. history, and it doesn't, you can even refuse to engage that history while you were in school. Exactly, exactly. To, to, to go back to that last, to the other comment about the, the rooms of silence, I've, I've, at Cooper Union, I had, uh, I was the only black person in the class in which um, my fellows refused to critique my work because they insisted that I was trying to make them feel stupid by asking questions about who we think black and brown women are in the city, because I didn't know. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I, I'd, made, I'd made a set of Mad Libs about um, uh, asking who we think uh, domestic workers are. It was mm -hmm. like a long-term project mm -hmm. of me observing domestic workers in the street, because I saw more people in the streets of New York and the parks in New York who looked like me than I did in my school. Mm -hmm. And it was just simple, like, my name is blank. I come from, you know, blank country. Mm -hmm. In my home country, my parents do this and this. Mm -hmm. I have this many siblings. They refused to critique the work, and they were not called on it by my beloved professor. So that's where, see, that's where the they, anything. They insisted upon ignorance. That's where the anything is possible stops. You can do anything. Except. Except <laughs> deal with race in this studio. Mm -hmm. And rather than say, rather than say, I am uncomfortable Rather than say, my education doesn't support what you want to unpack in here, let's bring some people in. Aside from me, yeah, aside from me, to help you get your work to the next level. Um, just to piggyback off of that really quickly, um, the other experience which Anastasia and I spoke about at length is when a student does approach a faculty member, the faculty then puts the responsibility of having this world of knowledge of black artists, mm -hmm. black scholars, to then educate that, well, who do you suggest we should put on the syllabus? And this, is what, this goes back to the question about, uh, is it time for faculty to go back to school? Because the students are here to learn from you and so then it's sort of the responsibility is on faculty to know and not put that on students. And so if, the, if then if the faculty doesn't know and we get into a critique and your professor is like, I don't know, and the students are like, I don't know. Uh, and a whole bunch of students are like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then, you know, then, that, then that isolates the student, right? Um, okay, so I think we have to be wrapping up. So um, I guess our last question uh, from the audience. I wish, our, I wish history courses were more diverse in its representation. Do you know what it would take to integrate these ideas and people into public history um, conscious, I think? And so that's a kind of a base question that we've had throughout the panel. Um, I guess this idea of how do we integrate without this guise of integration, segregation as integration, and truly make our classrooms and our faculty and our student bodies more diverse and trying to, how do we pursue equality even when it seems impossible? One of the ways I'd like to see that happen is we just get rid of some of these qualifiers. Uh, it's American history. It's not black history and American history. Uh, you know, if we can just get rid of that type of thinking, I think a lot of space is opened for us to actually have diversity. Because if we just say it's history, then you have to deal with everything that happened in within history. a specific period of time. Yes. You know, so it's not. Um, it's not about these silos, it's not Asian art, it's not, you know, black art, it's art. And if you really just get rid of those qualifiers up front and really just think of it in the essence of what it is, 
then if you're going to talk about abstract expressionism, you can't leave Norman Lewis out. You can't, you can't leave uh, Sam Gilliam out. You, you, because they were abstract expressionists at that time in history. So for me, that's it's it's a really simple. Just stop with the stop with the silos. We don't have to have Black History classes. We can just have history classes, and maybe you're going to break it up in eras from 1910 to 1950 and do it like that and then include everything that happened in history in that period. I mean, that would be the ideal. <laughs> That's but what we're already, talking about. Well, yeah, That's what I mean, we're talking about. What would be the ideal? Yeah. How would we do it? But, you know, how could you do it? Absolutely. But um, I, I want to push back on that a little bit be, just because um, I, I resist I resist the, 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 the continued problematizing of like vicinity specific education um, um, and, uh, and like records of history. And um, I'm wary of language that um, seeks to, um, that insists upon, um, well, like erasure of difference as a solution um, because it's so often like, you know, like with the Backy case, it's just, you know, it's like the, the, the language of liberation um, and and like a you know ideal idealistic equality like braided up to be some like you know neo right wing um, you know school choice vouchers you know <laughs> school choice shut down all your schools in Philadelphia and Chicago right. so that's choice you know you can you know like but but choice initially was the language of desegregation mm -hmm. so um, I mean I, I I I'm with you in that um, in that this is like a, a world history that we're talking we're talking about peoples of the worlds and mm -hmm. creative products of the worlds and, mm -hmm. uh, and and art of the art of the peoples of the world that have been like very with like great intention a lot of energy has gone into into excluding um, knowledge about uh, 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 um, like Asian contemporary art like. Uh, um, uh, just a lot of a lot of energy a lot of spirit <laughs> has gone into specifically ex excluding knowledge of, uh, of non-white people, mm -hmm. of, non of people of non-European descent across disciplines. So, um, you know, so it's like, it, and it, like under that guise, like that language has, that, that ideal has already been used, right? Like, oh, this is just history, or we are all American, or, you know, like that, that kind of like ends up leaning towards uh, like rationalizing nationalism that, that, still, that still excludes. So, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I, I, ideally, yes, I, but I'm also, I'm also, um, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of all the times that that sort of that language of equalization is used against us. I, I would also say, I mean, I think it's very important for students to understand the financial leverage that you have in in, in colleges and universities, and so what you want. Um, is what is needed to keep the school going. And so if you want more and different types of history, if you want more and different types of art education, collectively, the more you express that desire, the more likely it is to happen. And so you know, the only reason we have women's studies and uh, ethnic studies and African-American studies to the extent that we do is because students demanded it. And the more intransigent administrations were, the more intransigent the demands became. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you don't have to accept institutions as you find them, which is, and the bad news is, you know, don't you want to just like open your books and do your work and mind your business? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sure, but that's not how life is, right? If you want something bespoke, then you actually need to customize it, right? And so, and, and it's really, I think the burden becomes less when you don't act alone, right? When you don't say, okay, well, it's on me to deal with this professor that's saying it's my responsibility to figure out how to diversify the syllabus, right? When you band together and organize as a group, you really get something out of it. I think that's an, a different type of education, but a really important one, which is how to advocate for your needs and in institutions. And that's something that you are, I mean, you're trying to be artists, you're going to need to be doing that a lot. So it's a really important and helpful life skill that you can get practice on just trying to address these issues in your school. There's a great history of Cornell, the Cornell, Cornell's history of uh, what became the Africana Studies 
uh, department. Mm -hmm. And um, like that, that really matters a lot. Like the difference between a department, like department distinction mm -hmm. and what's happened in Cornell is a crazy racist campus um, and produced like some amazing, amazing people under the tutelage of Dr. Uh, Turner, um, who uh, James, Turner. James Turner, I wasn't there, but I have friends who were there and they are different kind of people. They are, they are intellectually different kind of people. Um, but but I, I speak to the, to the, um, to the notorious racism, um, the generational racism on the campus of Cornell, like burning down the Native American house. You know, white, white frat boys burning down the Native boys. They're men burning down the Native American house, uh, uh, burn, trying to burn down uh, the the Ujima the Ujima house or the Ujama Uj, um, you know where the because because uh, the students the students there can live in uh, in in groups if they choose to, um, like a lot of violence, uh, uh, students going missing, being driven off into gorges while they're walking across campus to school, like all sorts of crazy stuff, um, and in the middle of all that, generationally. Um, that department was created because students banded together and insisted upon it. It was like one of the, kind of like what happened here at uh, the Medgar Evers CUNY school. It's like one of those stories of students just like holding on and really insisting upon change. And, and, I, and, and again, I, I mentioned the, 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 genera the generational, like gobbling up everything kind of racism on that campus because only recently have they successfully uh, de-departmentalized Africana studies, I heard. That, that it, well, there, there's always been an effort for the Department of English to consume it or to make it, you know, who needs Africana studies, right? It's all English or it's all, anyways, there are histories, there are institutional histories of, um, of uh, what is it, of triumph mm -hmm. um, and uh, like that, that really illuminate the importance of these uh, programmatic distinctions. It's still a department. Okay, it's awesome. Still a depart it's still a department. I think the thing that's important, everybody here who has siblings, raise your hands, please. Oh, not me. Okay, all right. I want to talk about justice. Those of you with siblings know that you were not raised the same. And some of you mad about it. <laughs> still. <laughs> still mad about it. But somehow the, the wisdom of uh, of uh, your parents, guardians, aunts, uncles, nanas, knew what each of you needed. And so the barrier to a more perfect union has been the pursuit of some mathematical equality that has people looking at the size of the slice of the pie and saying, either it should be bigger or I should have the whole pie. So in order for us to achieve and be focused on justice, it's important to understand the power of language. We live in a racially segregated state of being in the United States of America. And when we use terms like diversity, again, it's race evasive, and it's ahistorical, and it doesn't get to the heart of the matter that there are people who have never sat down and cracked over, open a book written by an African-American scholar. I ask a question at, I, uh, I have a seminar called Photography in the American Dream, where we unpack the ways in which poverty, is represented and misrepresented in American newspapers. And one of the th features of the course is the search for poor white people in the American media. And that, um, like, that's a knowing sound, right? You can barely find them. Because part, how do you reconcile a country built on the principle of white supremacy and you have poor white people? Without unpacking the fact that you have, uh, you have democratic capitalism that, in, that requires people to be poor. So I think it's important to understand that what I do in my class is that I ask students, most of them are seniors, I ask them, at the beginning, of, uh, I have an entrance survey and I have an exit survey, because we're going to talk about, we're talking about solutions. I come in, I ask them, 
to give me the name of a um, nonfiction text that they've either self-assigned or been assigned as a student at Cornell. Then I asked them to give me the names of artists that are must-haves on their dance party list. So the answer to the first question is filled with European men and women who are white or claim to be white. And then, of course, the second question is filled with black and Latino and Caribbean names. So at the end of the course, what I do, I ask them the question that I really want to know. Give me the name of a nonfiction text written by an African-American scholar that you've been, you self-assigned or been assigned as a student here at Cornell. And these, most of them are seniors, and it's zero. So if I ask the majority of people in this audience to give me a, uh, their opinions on quantum physics, People are shaking their no. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. Do you think So, and the reason that most people will say no is that they haven't studied it. But art and race are two topics where people feel a level of authority where they haven't studied. They believe it's based on, certainly art is based on taste, based on feelings, and again, completely separated from ideologies, completely separated from power. And in the matter of race, it's whatever they saw on social media or uh, whatever they've seen in, in 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 the Spike Lee movie, <laughs> uh, or what they've seen, Thank what they've you. seen in the media, and so the the point is this: most of us have come through, most of us sitting up here, uh, who are either in or have come through a higher education, and especially higher education uh, related to art and design, on an imbalanced intellectual diet. Imbalanced, and what's going to change this are the three O's: opposition, opportunity, and oversight. So it begins with students opposing this monocular, siloed, Euro-Western set of canonical references that you hear all the time. You have to ask, OK, 19, 1940-something, uh, Jackson Pollock, Peggy Guggenheim, Wilhelm de Kooning. What else was going on in the United States at the time that influence affected, impacted the work? that we should talk about. And, and it will take you places that those of you who are wondering about where your next idea is going to come from, I'm telling you. I'm at a point in my life, and I think I'm, I share that with, with everybody on this stage. I have more ideas than I know what to do with. Because I went beyond what someone told me represents a terminal degree, and, that, and the content of that terminal degree. And what happens when you ask the question, who else is doing something? Who else has written? Who else has sung? Who else has composed? Who else has made a, a, a cinema that can transform? That's the power you all have. You have the power to oppose this. The next thing is opportunity. We need people outside of the academy who will create endowed chairs to situate scholars, artists, musicians, writers, designers for the purpose of desegregating the discourse. 
and making them university and scholars, basically, where they're not situated in a department. They are the scholar for the entire school, and they can show up anywhere. The third O is oversight. In order for this to move forward, we need the next generation of scholars to have desegregated bibliographies, desegregated research questions as conditions for promotion and tenure. Thank you guys, you guys are amazing. Um, thanks everyone for coming out to this, uh, to this panel discussion and I hope that you, you're walking away with, with something that you can go raise hell with. Okay, thank you.